some of the first climbs I can remember, check. And Donnie lived kitty corner from me on, on 6th Street. And between his bedroom window and my bedroom window was a street lamp. And somehow we rigged a rope. In these days, it was before nylon ropes. It was, uh, well, probably when we were 9 or 10, maybe 11. Uh, we, sh we shimmied up to the top of the street lamp and tied a rope on the street lamp then to my bedroom window and tied on the radiator. And same thing from the street lamp to his bedroom. And I can't remember what we tied it on to in his, his house, but we would do these uh, Tyrolean traverses, uh, you know, between each other's houses. So that uh, that was really the first climbing that, that I did. And, uh, in those years, I guess, maybe I was 10 and, and maybe up to the time I was 12 or 13 before I really got into into the mountains. I guess one of the uh, first climbs we did, okay, of any consequence, was in December of 63. Uh, Brian Greenwood had uh, moved in down the block and uh, went into Brian's basement and bought some equipment. You know, a rucksack and an ice axe and, and some of the uh, other sort of basic climbing stuff. And one of the first climbs was the Traverse of Mount Rundle. That's right. Which we did in uh, whatever December that was. We uh, uh, we knew nothing about climbing. I mean, we read in the books and we'd gone down to the public library and read the old Alpine journals a little bit. And... Uh, this was may not have been the first climb, but it was the first really memorable climb, mm -hmm. where uh, after school got out, say around December twentieth, we we did this traverse of Rundle. Spent right. three days, knew nothing about climbing, and I and I just when I think back of what I did, and the age I was, and I look at the kids these days, I thought, holy oh, shit, I'd never allow my kids to do that. But we knew nothing about climbing, so we take the ice axe, and. We're slab climbing, run the ice axe up and down the slab until it held. Pull a little bit and then we go hand over hand up the ice axe and find some place for our feet and to balance and then do the same thing again. Um, not really realizing that, at least now, I, I'd, be, I'd be very hesitant to do something like that. Uh, slept on the ridge. I had a bivy sack, but no experience in bivouacking even really in summer. And from... Uh, wallowing through all the various snow our knickers got reasonably wet and uh, for whatever reason we took them off but I can remember in the morning having them absolutely frozen solid and flat as a board and not being able to get them on and so here we are I think I left my long underwear on but the knickers were like planks and having to take our uh, uh, piton hammers and, and whap them into into round so we could get them around our our legs and eventually with the body heat melt them. Yeah. Uh, and on the third day coming down into into Banff, that's where we developed the term hard ass. Maybe over the years, Chick or Donnie and I talk about hard asses. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, this this is where we learn to uh, start avalanches. We take rocks and we throw them into the snow, start an avalanche, jump on the tail end, and then. We'd be roaring down the side of Mount Randall on the tail end of this avalanche, and we'd feel the snow building up on our backs. So we roll out to the side, wait for the tail end of, to come again. And these weren't big avalanches, obviously, but surface sloughs. But still reasonably size. Mm -hmm. Jump on the tail again, continue down the mountainside. And the hard ass came when we went over cliffs. Now, when I'm talking cliffs, we're talking six or eight feet. But just bumping on the edge of the cliff before we, we went over. And I think we got off Mount Rundle in about half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's starting, you know, starting avalanches. And that's something we did over the next several years, up until the time I got my guide's license and figured out that that's uh, not the safest way to get off mountains. But that was one of the first sort of what I would call my first hard climb. Yeah. Previous to that, but Donnie would come over and, and uh, uh, because his family, uh, well, he'd come over and, do you have a date tonight? No. Do you have a date tonight? No. Okay, so we, we made our date with the mountains. And uh, we'd uh, go up to Banff, uh, leave Calgary on a, uh, Friday night at uh, 7 o'clock, 7.30, drive up to the mountains. So anyway, we'd put Logan bread and Coke in the, in the pack and uh, just start climbing. 
and uh, as often not as not there was a moon and we'd climb till 11 11 30 and get to the top or almost to the top and it was amazing how many times that you know in the darkness we'd find a little ledge somewhere and sleep on it overnight and find that that was the only reasonable place on the whole mountain to sleep and how we found it in the dark at 11 at night or 11 30 or midnight don't know but uh, uh, we get up in the morning and, and have our piece of bread and wash it down with coke and continue our climb and, and some of the climbs were uh, I think the knob I'm not sure whether that's the real name for it or not but it's across from Canmore Mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, Peachy, uh, Gerard, and Ingalls Moldy sort of one night of those uh, types of climbs. And I guess in those days, too, you know, we went down to the uh, Calgary Mountain Club mm -hmm. just to hero worship. And uh, I think that's probably where I met you. Don't know. Can't remember. I can't quite remember. It was, uh, but, I was uh, in grade 12 and you were in grade 11, so it was right. in high school still. Yeah, it was still in high school and... and uh, uh, actually, Donnie's some of Donnie's older brothers, older friends used to climb. Yeah. Jim Board and yeah. and Peter Spear and, and and some of those. So, so they sort of led the way for Donnie and, and got him going. And of course, I was his friend, and you like to do what your peers do. Yeah. So, those were some of the earlier climbs that we did in 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 high school. In the summer of '64, we did the traverse of the uh, Lake Louise sort of horseshoe, you know, starting off on, on Mount Fay or Mount Babel, actually, and then working way around the, the Ten Peaks and Ungabi and on Glacier Peak and Lafroy and all the way around back to Lake Louise, which was 23 peaks in, uh, in seven days. We were so naive, we didn't know what we could and couldn't do. And we did a lot of uh, unroped climbing, uh, a lot of stuff that just, uh, how can I say... With my years of experience now, and even though I haven't been that active in recent years, I just would, would never have done again. And we soloed an awful lot of it, and, and that might be one of the reasons why it hasn't been done again, is that the, the people who've tried it are more prudent and mm -hmm. uh, have more experience and weren't really aware of the risks. But uh, uh, that was, I think it was seven bivouacs on that, if my memory serves me correct. And uh, I guess that was one of the really first big summer climbs mm -hmm. that we did and uh, you know if I had to list maybe you know 10 great accomplishments in my life I think that climb would be one of them yeah but I often tell people today what one of my most beautiful aesthetic mountain experiences has ever been and that was coming off Hungabi and uh, uh, skiing down the glacier below Hungabi and, and I can't remember the name of it anymore but uh, Opaven. Opaven Glacier. Yeah. And, and looking at the uh, our tracks, which were just a ribbon of darkness on the light glacier. Yeah. And just, as you might have gathered, I have bought as much culture as a two-by-four. <laughs> but anyway, that was, to me, was, was really a spiritually moving yeah. event coming off uh, Ngobi after after that climb. They really didn't do a lot of the technical climbs on Yam in those days in terms of pioneering them. But... Uh, I think the first real hard climb I did was uh, a climb with Don called Mum's Tears. I think that yeah. might have been the only one that I've really done on Yam that I did the first ascent, was involved uh, on the first ascent. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I led some of it. And uh, But, no, it was, uh, it was pretty scary. And in those days, uh, well, there was the deer tismas and the red shirts, which were the harder climbs in those days. But... Uh, being involved with uh, uh, Don Vakroff and Brian to a certain extent, they always needed people to climb with them. So, and I was always most privileged to be able to, to climb with these heroes was quite a status symbol, I think, in those days. Almost every weekend, we'd do a first descent of something. Yeah. And that was one of the criteria. Had anybody done it before? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Then we won't do it. We'll go find something else. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, in those days, we could we could do it. Yeah. But to a certain period there, in the early years, we used to write it up in the in the Alpine journals, and then for a number of years, uh, we didn't write up nothing. And quite often, we didn't even sign the registers on the top of the mountain. We sort of went underground, did yeah. the climbs, but didn't tell very many people about it. 
And then for a couple of years, I can remember with Lloyd, we just signed the the little book, you know, in the Karen at the top, Charlie, Lloyd, Chick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> As if we, we, we were starting to get full of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> People would obviously know who Charlie or Lloyd or Chick was. Yeah. Uh, but uh, on... Uh, on Temple, uh, and again, it's been a long time since I, uh, I really thought about that. But I think it was in the Bugaboos on on a weekend. There's a number of climbers in there in those days, and uh, that was uh, there was the I think just a little uh, these little plastic igloos was in there at the time. It was before any of the modern or beefed up climbing hat was there, and there's that little cave. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I talked to Brian, and, and Brian uh, suggested that I join him on on uh, on Temple. And uh, and you know we've been talking about Temple and how hard it was over the years. There've been climbers like uh, Chenard up and Royal Robbins and all these people that you know, we would read about in the magazines and had tried it. And uh, so there was uh, Brian. Uh, and myself and uh, Heinz Call, mm -hmm. and uh, so we, you know, made the arrangements and, and met in a in a bar in Banff to talk about it. So we, we the next couple of days, you know, we reconnoitered the face, and these guys are arguing back and forth as which was the best route, and I hardly knew what Temple looked like. Well, I mean, I did, but I I couldn't tell uh, various areas of the face that that they'd named, and of course, because of our interest in mountaineering, you know, we'd been reading all the books about the Iger North Face and all these, uh, the Rebo Fats books and, and all those types of things that, mm -hmm. that, that really were inspiration. And Rebo Fats books especially created the poetry and the ambiance and the romantic feeling about the mountains. Uh, so anyway, we uh, camped at Lake Annette uh, after in the bar and started up the face and again I was really fit and Brian and Heinz weren't quite as fit but uh, climbed oh, at least the lower third of the face unroped and then Heinz started to fall farther and for, farther back and and at that time uh, I'm not even sure Heinz knew whether or not he had leukemia but uh, it turned out that he did and, and uh, that was one of the reasons that uh, he was uh, he was uh, slower um, so, during that first day, he uh, he decided to turn around, and that left uh, Brian and I. So anyway, we worked our way up the face. And some of the situations there was saying I was sort of said to myself, you know, gee, just like the books, <laughs> when you see you know the, the the two climbers on the face and snowing at night and avalanches coming down and and you know the ledges that we thought we would just walk along to, to traverse, you know, turned out to be fairly steep icy, difficult uh, stuff to, to work your way across. Mm -hmm. But but we'd read the books. You know, I had to pretend to Brian that I knew what I was doing. Even in those days, I had a pretty good eagle, so I had to keep up. So he'd lead a pitch, and then I'd follow up and lead the next pitch, and you know, go back and forth, uh, working the way up the face, and you know, look one way, and if it didn't go, come down and look another way. And, and uh, that's actually served me well in life those days. Because I didn't, I was too boneheaded to turn back. In those days, uh, very few climbs I was ever on that we really turned around on. A lot of people would go up and uh, quit for whatever reason. But uh, I think that sort of half or made my our, my name in climbing mm -hmm. that uh, route. Uh, even though we did a lot of neat things and hard climbs before that, and, and certainly a lot afterwards. That's one of the ones that you can, I look back at and say, God, that's kind of neat. After having done Temple, I mean, we could do anything. Now Babel, that was a toughie. I wouldn't say the most difficult climbing that, that I've ever done. The rock was, was very uh, firm, and it was more like the pictures you'd see in the European climbing books there was more technical stuff on Babel in yeah. terms of penduluming and we'd never done it before but we saw the pictures 
and uh, didn't know enough to be afraid. I, I used an excessive amount of aid to, aid to get off it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, you did. You did. But, but that was the, the top pitch on, on, on Babel. And I think that's been climbed now two or three times. Yeah. I know Urs has done it, and I'm not sure who else. But Jeff uh, Marshall free climbed the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, it just shows you, uh, you know, what the levels of, of technique yeah. now are. I mean, yeah. they're far above and beyond we can even imagine. Yeah. But it's the only climb on, on the hundreds of peaks that we've done in the Rockies that it was easier to plan your route by, by looking out towards the valley. Then by looking in at the rock, because you weren't, it was so overhanging, at least to me it was overhanging, that it was easier to look out to the valley and, and look up to figure out uh, which way to go. Yeah. And uh, that's my only story in the, in, about climbing trick. That did, that's the one that didn't work. <laughs> that's the one that didn't work. That's yeah. the one that didn't work. And, and Brian tried to get up this pitch, and, and thank God it was his lead, and that didn't work. And so he came down, and, and I got up a little higher than Brian did. And again, uh, uh, the aid we were using uh, probably my own fault but uh, gave way and down I came you know ping 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 till the last beat on held and when you fall of course you put your hands out and about 30 feet or so below the belay is when I, where I hit the rock and dislocated my wrist and I know Parks talks about it as the first rescue it was a it was a, a great day for Walter Perrin, but it was a black day for Charlie and Brian. Yes, I mean in terms of Walter Perrin and 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 Billy Room, yeah. uh, and the little winch system that Walter worked up. I mean, uh, it worked, thank goodness. Yeah. But it was sort of scary as they changed the uh, the knots. We dropped six inches, mm. and it's imagine you know when you drop six inches, that takes a long time to drop six inches. Your mind goes pretty. Oops, you know. <laughs> uh, so uh, I know that at the time I was a young guy and a little bit critical of Parks. But as I get older, I'm most appreciative of, of the risks that they took because it must have been terrifying for these wardens who were used to riding horses to now ride in a helicopter and, and be stuck on, high on this mountain without, you know, without the experience. Yeah. So Babel's the one that didn't work. Yeah. The uh, spring of 67 uh, was a ski yeah. traverse. That ski traverse again was number three, my great, ten greatest achievements in life. And uh, I consider myself pretty fortunate to be involved uh, in that. So, Chuck, it was you and I who then who did a lot of the gathering of the equipment, uh, yeah. trying to get sponsors. I know that uh, I can remember again receiving one of these middle of the night phone calls and Reader's uh, Digest phoning up and offering us 500 bucks. Yeah. Not Reader's Digest, the uh, Star Weekly. Yeah, that's right. And, and I'm thinking, uh, God, I'm not going to become a whore for 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and right. I can't even remember what the cost of the trip yeah. was, but it yeah. wasn't that much more than 500 no, per person. No. Uh, but I remember, you know, writing Kelty. That's right, writing and trying to get, you know, Kelty packs and writing the uh, free, freeze-dry uh, manufacturers and trying to get uh, sponsorships. And I think it was a lot harder in those days than it is now. I, I keep telling people when when we did that trip, I mean, there really weren't maps on some of that area. No, there weren't. There weren't maps. There were just a peak and, and the air photo. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of scary when you, again, when you think of the age that we did that at 20 and 21, and, and my yeah. daughter's now 18. I mean, I can't in a million years imagine any 18-year-old kids that I know doing the stuff that we did. Yeah, no. But again, that was was great experience in the spring of 67 in terms of giving us the, and giving me the, the feel for, for the snow. Yeah. You know, we'd done a lot of touring over the years. What did I say? That was the third big pillar of, of what I did in, in the mountains. Yeah. And uh, certainly set the stage for um, later on in 67, getting my guide's license. When I took the course, it was two weeks and Either you passed or you didn't pass. And I think the only reason I passed was that, uh, that well, that ski trip. You know, we, we'd done a lot of things successfully that, that our teachers hadn't. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think they had the nerve to, to fail us. Uh, Don Vokrath and I, uh, Bernie Schieser, two or three others, all got our guide's license in that year. And that was one of the first classes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was almost the first class. 
in uh, uh, of, of modern Canadian guides. Yeah. In those days, you didn't have to pay the tuition up front. I, I was only going to pay them if I passed. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe they knew this. That's why they decided to pass me. It's the only way they were going to get their 250 bucks. Mm-hmm. That summer of 1967, you uh, got your guide's license? Yeah, and uh, guided for the Alpine Club a little bit. Uh, started working with uh, Bernie Schuster and John Gow in High Horizons. Mm-hmm. Uh, sort of, that filled up the summer. And then when I couldn't get jobs, which was quite a lot of the time, I'd, uh, I'd go climbing with with yourself and, and uh, Don and... and uh, Lloyd McKay. Mm -hmm. During those years from 69, 70, 71 into 72, I did a a number of other climbs. In those days, it was what hasn't been climbed, let's go climb it. And that was sort of some of the criteria with with, uh, Don Walkroth and Lloyd McKay and and yourself. Uh, In in those years, they were just starting ice climbing in the winter. Mm And uh, I just got into that a little bit. But actually, after the winter ascent of Forbes, that was one of my last sort of big winter climbs. And uh, after having been out for four or five days and 30 below weather and almost freezing my nuts off, I thought I'd better get married and have some kids while I still have nuts. (laughs) (laughs) uh, So for the last 25 years, I've really been involved in ranching. And... and, uh, for 25 years, uh, at that time, I, as I mentioned earlier, I was in the ski business, yeah. and uh, the ski business in the investment business. Yeah. yeah. But we did a, an underwriting for Lake Louise Lifts in 1974, and I bought shares then. Yeah. But I did like the look of the ski business, and between 74 and and uh, 1980, I, I bought out, gradually increased my ownership. 80, bought out the rest of the partners, and. Uh, here we are in the ski business for the last uh, 15 or 16 years and boy I consider myself one of the most fortunate people ever and it's not because I was any smarter when I look at the back of the pack of us then and then you or Donnie or any of the others it's just I took a slightly different road and uh, was real lucky and and then became what I am now in terms of owning the ski areas. But yeah. climbing was extremely instrumental in how I've done in life. You put climbing and farming together, and the, the, the two ingredients that, the, that, that I needed to be successful in business, the climbing in terms of never quitting, and always looking for the alternate route, mm-hmm. seeing which way it goes, mm-hmm. and, and farming and ranching in terms of the broad uh, perspective of being a little of everything, I've applied to being uh, successful in business. Yeah. End of chapter. That's a wrap, Chick. <laughs>